Hello everyone and welcome to Disaster Recovery. Now you're going to notice that there are going to be some similarities between Disaster Recovery and CERT from the last topic and that's because they do go together. In general if we are going to have an emergency or more commonly known as an incident now, then we also have to make sure that we have a plan in case something goes wrong for this particular incident that we're talking about. Now, when we talk about disaster recovery, we could be talking about any variety of disaster. Now, this could be natural disasters, snowstorms, hurricanes. Um, this kind of thing can be an issue Anywhere in the world that you are, natural disasters can occur. We could also have disasters of the more person-made variety, where we might be talking about something like the company is attacked, or something went wrong with a backup, or, you know, for example, maybe everybody got sent home for some reason, and it's not that a snowstorm came in, it's just that something went wrong with the company's servers or network or whatever it happened to be. So what we need to do is we need to first assume nothing will work, so we can't rely on the current system, communications, phone lines, or anything like that. And then we need to have a plan for what to do to recover from that incident happening. Now, this is going to have a lot of the same similarities as a CERT because we still need to have the assumption, uh, well actually I should say, a uh, CERT, the previous topic, which was Computer Emergency Response Team or Computer Security Incident Response Team, one of the things that they will generally do is have a disaster recovery plan because a security incident is one form of disaster that we might need to protect against. Now this is going to be a lot of the same people making this plan and again we need to have this plan made so that it's all prepared to go. We don't want to try to do this on the fly. We do not want to have oh we'll just deal with that later, oh we'll just make a decision when that comes. That is never a good way to do things because we always have to remember that in general, if something has happened, a stressful situation is going on, people have the tendency to panic. And so we want to have a nice, clear plan with a lot of calm people so that we know exactly what it is that we should be doing. So we are again going to have the C-suite people, the big decision makers, because we have to have somebody with the authority to be able to say, yes, we can do this, or no, we can't do that, or whatever it happens to be. We want to have some of the IT people on there. That's going to be important so that they can look at the different systems and the technologies and know what we're capable of. We're going to want to have sales and accounting and finance people in here as well because they're going to know their departments the best, the software they need the best, and all of those pieces of the company have to be part of our disaster response plan. So anyone that you picked for a CERT, you're going to need here. You're also going to need an alternate or a backup. We want to make sure that we never have what's considered a bottleneck of knowledge. That means we don't want to ever have everything so reliant on a single person that that person not being available for whatever reason is going to completely break down our system. So like, for example, if we had a whole bunch of things that were reliant on a single person and that single person is out sick on the day of the disaster or incident, we have to be able to still execute all of our plans. We can't say, oh, well, they're not here, so, oh, well, I guess we've just lost everything. That's not going to be okay. So we have to make sure that we have alternates and backups for everything that we're talking about. Now, on the plan, we want to look at hardware, software, people, we want to have backups, we want to have testing, and we want to have somebody that is paying attention to what's going on, the sort of who watches the watchers. We want to make sure that we have lots of redundancies and fail-safes and lots of people looking at this because we want to make sure everybody is represented. Everything that needs to be taken care of is being taken care of and everybody is confident that it's being taken care of, and then we want to have other people look it over and approve it. This is not the kind of thing that we would want to, for example, do in secret and not tell anybody about. 
So first we want to look at hardware. So for our disaster recovery plan, what do we do if our hardware disappears? We have a uh, fire, we have flood, if you live in the Northeast, we have snowstorms. Um, what happens if we can't get to our hardware? What happens if that hardware is damaged? What happens if our servers are living in a basement and the basement floods because we had a rainstorm come in? So we have to have a plan for that. We have to look at on-site versus off-site. So one of the things that has been changing in the world is people doing a lot more work from home. So some companies actually don't even have an on-site anymore. Everything is off-site because they are completely remote companies. Companies that are moving to a remote or hybrid remote style plans, they have to worry about everything being backed up if they have an actual office if they don't have an actual office, how are they still backing up all of the work? Where is that being done? Is there anything being done just on, say, employees' laptops? How are they handling those backups? Those are all really important. Some companies actually do have rentable disaster recovery hardware. So like, for example, let's say you have a backup of a backup of a backup and your third layer of backup is on tape. Well, you're probably not going to want that for your first layer because that's going to be a lot harder to access, a lot slower, a lot more bulky. But a backup of a backup of a backup for, you know, absolute emergencies, maybe that makes sense. But maybe you don't need to invest and keep up to date with a tape player. Maybe what you do is you have all of those tapes and then once a year or twice a year, you test those tapes with rented hardware. That might actually be a cheaper way to do things. Some companies will also make agreements with other companies as backups. So company A will say to company B, hey, could you please back up all of our stuff? Company B will say, yeah, sure, if you back up all of ours, and they form an agreement. So. For example, if you are going to school at Northern Essex, you know, what happens to our servers? Do we have backups? So um, we can actually do things like partner with other schools so that we can be a backup for another school and another school can be a partner backup with us. Now, there is a very important side note in here, which is related specifically to documentation. If you are a backup, if a, an agreement has been made, if you need a backup, you have to make sure that this is very well documented. The people or the person that made those agreements and made those agreements, you cannot always guarantee that they are going to stay in that job. Even in industries where people tend to stay in a single job for a very long time, you cannot just assume that they are going to be in that job forever. You have to make sure that you have documentation so that let's say, for example, company A and company B made an agreement to be each other's backup. So this has been working really well. The people that officially made the agreement have now moved on to another company. Now, if this has been documented well, then hopefully everything is going fine and we would be able to continue to have that work. But if it wasn't documented, company A says, well, this is all this data is going somewhere. Where is it going? Well, why is it going to company B? That doesn't make any sense. And then you potentially lose one of your backup plans or something goes wrong and you say, oh, no, we don't have a backup or company B doesn't realize why all this data from company A is coming in. And they're just kind of going, um, maybe I should be concerned here. I'm not sure. And then now we have to worry about what's going on there. Is our backup actually happening? So it's important to document all of that. Now for software, we want to make sure that we are backing up our software and programs. We don't want to just back up our data. So one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing is we are backing up all of the data for the programs, but we're also going to be backing up all of the settings for the programs. We can do different types of backups. We can have byte by byte backups, so that's going to be an exact literal copy of a particular computer or system. We can have incremental backups, which is I want to back up anything that hasn't already been backed up. We can also do different types of backups, so we could have once a day backups, once a week backups, once a month backups. And the thing that you want to remember about backups and disasters, back up anything you are not willing to lose. Set your backup as often as you're willing to redo work. So what that is for you, your company, your situation. Are you willing to lose a day's worth of work? 
a week's worth of work, how much are you willing to redo? How much is the company willing to redo? Now, in a lot of cases, for a lot of companies, especially the larger ones, they might say something like, well, we are only willing to lose a day's worth of work or an hour's worth of work or 10 minutes worth of work. And so they're going to have to set their backups to make sure that they can get up and running as quickly as possible. Now, this is going to be especially true for companies that have to worry about something called uptime. Because of, there are quite a few companies now that sell things as a service, they have to have in their agreements very specific uptime requirements. You will be able to get access to our service guaranteed this amount of time. Now, one of the things you have to pay attention to with these uptime agreements is, let's say, for example, we guaranteed 99% uptime. Well, that means 99 days out of 100, the service is working great. However, that means there's going to be at least three-ish days a year that the service could be down within that contract. That's why you'll see a lot of companies have 99.9% .9 uptime or 99.6% uptime, that kind of thing. Um, but you have to take that into account when we're talking about backups because what if we are that company? What if our company is as a service and every, let's say, 10 minutes that we're down or hour that we're down, we're potentially losing money or we are going out of contract. And sometimes those contracts can actually have really stiff financial penalties. So for a lot of companies, they can lose considerable amounts of money even being down for an hour. Think about it like one of the really big companies right now, Google. Let's say everything went down at Google for an hour. How much money do you think they would lose being down just one hour? That's one hour of nobody being able to do Google searches, nobody being able to do Google Analytics, nobody being able to use Google's DNS. All of the people that are being paid at Google are officially being paid to do nothing. Google has some of the highest salaries in industry. So there's people that are making, you know, well over $200,000 in quite a few jobs there. Think what they're paid per hour. Start adding that up to the hundreds or thousands of employees that they might have. And that's just one hour. That's how much money can be lost. Now for backups, we have to look at the medium that we're using. So part of our backup plan has to be how we are doing the backups, how long these backups will last, and how long we need to keep them. Now depending on the industry, we might end up having some specific laws or regulations in regards to this. So you could think about things like, for example, taxes or financials. Well, those might need to be, by law, backed up three years back, seven years back, um, you know, a lot of the sort of common sense, common wisdom is, you know, you keep your taxes for seven years. But for some of the financial companies, they might have very specific, we must keep our records going back so far. That has to be part of your backup plan. A lot of those companies are also going to have very sensitive information. So we have to look at how is it protected? How is it encrypted? Who actually has access to this? And a big one, which a lot of people don't necessarily think about, is verifying and testing our backups. A backup is only good if it is actually useful. If we have a backup and something goes wrong with that backup and we can't access it, that is no longer a useful backup. So we have to think about how we are actually verifying the backup that we've set for our disaster recovery plan is going to work. Do you have backups of your backups? Do you have backups of your backups of your backups? These are things that need to be built into the plan and depending on how much redundancy you need, you might have lots of these. We might have on-site and off-site backups, so we might have third-party backups or in-house backups. We might have all of the above, depending on the company and the type of redundancy that company needs. We might have in-house backups, both inside and off-site. We might have third-party backups, both on-site and off-site. We might have a second third-party company doing a second set of backups, and all of those backups have to be protected protected, encrypted, we have to know who has access, we have to know that they're being verified, we have to know that they're being tested, and all of this has to go into our disaster recovery plan. One of the things that can make a lot of plans fail is one person. Our plan should never, ever, ever, ever be that person.
person. So it's really important that we never want to have a single point of failure. You need info on all of the systems. You need info on the passwords. You need info on who is actually going to be the backup for all of this information. You have to know how often the backup is being updated. You have to know how often your passwords are being updated. You need somebody that knows all of the infrastructure. All of these are really important pieces of a disaster policy because we want to make sure that our disaster policy is never going to be centered on a single person or a single point of failure. We want to make sure that this is a disaster policy for an entire company. And we need to make sure that lots of people know what's happening and how that's working so that we can make sure that our policy is nice and thorough. Then we have to look at our business continuity plan. Now, um, a business continuity plan is basically trying to figure out what is going to be happening with our business. Now the first thing that we do is a business impact analysis. There's different questionnaires and stuff um, to be able to figure out sort of what the impact would be of different disasters. We have different recovery strategies based off of different scenarios. So we might have a recovery strategy that's we've lost a server. We might have another recovery strategy that's we've lost five servers. We might have another recovery strategy that's we've lost our data warehouse and we have to be aware of all of those. We also want to make sure that we're doing gap analysis to make sure that we are looking at um, the gaps between the recovery and the requirements and our current capabilities, making sure that we have as few gaps as possible. We need to make sure that we have workarounds for everything. It's important that we have disaster recovery procedures. It's important that we have plans and it's important that we test all of these. Just like with CERT, it's really important that we take all of our disaster policies and disaster recovery and test it all. We have to conduct training for everybody so that everybody knows what's going on. We have to make sure this is part of our orientation and new employee training. And we have to make sure that we are testing this on a regular and frequent basis. One of the ways that we can test our disaster recovery plans is basically simulations and board games. We won't know if our plan is going to work until we test it. My example, let's say we put our entire plan in a beautiful binder. We have color coded it, we have worked on it, we've gotten the agreement and blessing from everybody. Everybody has agreed that this is a lovely plan that we have put in a binder. We've put it all into a locked safe. Now, what happens if the building is on fire? What happens if we have to evacuate? What happens if we have, and I sincerely hope this never ever happens again, um, another pandemic and we are all told to leave our offices, we'll be back soon, and our disaster recovery plan, who is taking the beautiful copy of our disaster recovery plan? Are we color coding and copying this binder so everybody gets sent home with a binder? How are we doing that? So all of that needs to be thought about as well. Um, and even disasters that might seem unlikely, we want to make sure we've at least thought about and have a plan for. We should test them at least once a year. So we should run some variety of simulation or war game for our disaster recovery at least once a year. When we find problems, and remember this is a when, not an if, when we find problems, we update the plan. We update the documentation of the plan. We update the training. And we have to make sure we are updating it everywhere that it needs to be. I have some examples of disaster recovery checklists. Checklists are a great way to do disaster recovery, just like, you know, flow charts and things. The thing that's really nice about checklists is it makes it a lot easier if something has gone wrong. If we have a problem, it's a lot easier for handing out a checklist and making sure that we've done everything we've already talked about. Did we do this? Did we do this? Did we do this? And just going right down the list. That's going to make a lot more sense to a lot more people. We're also going to be able to do it a lot faster. Because remember, in a disaster of any variety, we probably have people panicking and time is probably of the essence. So we want to make sure that we have nice, easy checklists. Have you checked the backups? Who can get access to things? Who currently has access? What's the plan if we can't get access? What's actually happening? Who's checked the logs? All of those things are going to be very important for us to keep track of. So looking through some of the white papers on best practices and some example checklists are a really good way to be able to see 
what people are actually doing in real life so that you can see some examples of what a checklist might look like. So thank you very much for joining me today for Disaster Recovery.